Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tony, I'm uh, Chief Legal Officer at SumSub and uh, today with us is uh, Yana Sosiotis. He is the leader of the Grant Thornton team for regulatory compliance services in Cyprus. He's a good friend of ours and uh, I know him as one of the leading uh, specialists in Cyprus for uh, lending global financials, uh, financial businesses onto Cyprus land or Cyprus soil. And so, uh, and he's also, of course, a leading specialist in uh, AML compliance. And so I think we will discuss today different subjects related to um, AML compliance in glo on global scale, specific questions related to Cyprus and uh, related, I would say, to compliance profession in general. Janos has uh, several uh, abbreviations after his last name, such as COMS and uh, Advanced Certificate in Financial Services uh, from the Cyprus Securities and Exchange Commission, CISEC. And he also has a Certificate in Global Financial Compliance from the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. By the way, uh, and maybe this would, would be a good starting question uh, from my side. Um, is it important for you, um, Janos, to pay attention to this, uh, like, these certificates, these abbreviations after last name for a compliance officer? Like, would you pay attention onto this uh, when you hire a, a person uh, on your firm, for example? Is it important in your opinion? It's, it's definitely one of the factors that we're going to be considering when, when looking at someone to hire. But even though I'm, you know, as a certificate holder myself, I'm inclined to say yes. I will say that they're important, but they're not as important as the personal attitudes that a person is going to bring along with them. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's about the capacity to learn and the capacity to stay curious and to keep learning exactly because in the compliance uh, field, things are happening all the time. So it's about the, the motivation and the spirit of the person more than the certifications. But if the person has both, then definitely it's a no-brainer. I mean, it definitely helps. You lead the uh, the Grant Thornton team for regulatory compliance services in Cyprus. Typically, I would say, um, as I see it, the obliged to entity uh, usually hires a, a full full time person to manage, uh, let's say, compliance procedures, AML procedures, uh, because it's cheaper. <laughs> and also, let's say, the in any case, the in house compliance officer who is necessary a necessary person. He is uh, independent from the executive power of the company and also uh, personally responsible for AML laws. And also, I would say that. Um, uh, you know, there are some uh, speculations and even jokes about Big Four consultants in the AML. Um, uh, I'm talking only about Big Four, not Big Five, not Big Six. Um, <laughs> so, so, in your opinion, um, where exactly, in which situations it really becomes important to engage, um, engage a consultant in uh, regulatory compliance? To be honest, uh, I think in all cases, and, and, and I can explain that. Uh, as, as you very correctly said, I mean, companies will have to hire an in-house compliance officer, right? Most of the times, this is a mandatory requirement for them. I mean, if they're going to be a regulated entity, they will definitely need to have an in-house compliance officer. However, I mean, considering how fast compliance requirements change globally on, on all areas, not just AML, on, uh, on regulatory compliance, financial services compliance, Really, companies, regulated companies nowadays, they need to navigate through an almost impossible maze of requirements, restrictions, things, things that they need to do, uh, new requirements that come about. And to top that, all of these new requirements, all of these compliance requirements that come about, they don't come with specific rules. Compliance requirements do not have a tick the box approach. They give you guidelines, they give you a regulatory framework, and you, as an entity, you need to find the way to comply according to your specific requirements. This task is, is, is almost impossible for any single person or even a small team of persons that are engaged in a single firm to do. So an external compliance, an external compliance advisor is going to be necessary to come in and help not because as, as persons, as professionals, they're better, but because of the position that they have, they have the ability and they have the, the privilege to be engaging 
with various colleagues, with various clients across industries, across countries. So basically the feedback that they have and the interaction that they have with different companies gives, you, gives them the, the ability to, to, to better understand what the requirement of the regulation is. So with this knowledge that they gather from the interaction with other participants in the industry, I think they have a unique, they can have a unique approach that can help the regulated company to, to enforce and to implement the requirements of the regulation. And this actually brings me to the next question that I have. Um, and obviously our audience would be very interested in this because we all the time hear one and the same question. What is the best jurisdiction right now for, let's say, a digital finance, fintech, crypto, forex industry? What would be like the best place to, to set up a company and UK, Cyprus, maybe Lithuania, Estonia? You mentioned UK. Now UK is a very specific case exactly because of the, of the Brexit. In most of the, of the compliance requirements uh, in the regards to passporting, meaning having your base in one country and having the ability to offer your services cross-border, this is a so-called passporting. In most cases, passporting for funds, for, uh, for regulated firms, for investment firms, uh, in a couple of years when MIGA comes about, which is uh, the, the new uh, regulation for, uh, for crypto assets, uh, passporting is, is, is a very critical issue. Now, the UK is not, being outside of the European Union, is not really an equivalent jurisdiction in terms of being a jurisdiction where you can have your license and then without any hindrances, without any, any questions, offering your services in the European Union and vice versa, having a license in the European Union and offering your services in the UK. Now, there was a grace period that was given to companies that had this uh, that had this arrangement because of Brexit. But for the UK, I believe that it's better to wait a couple of years until things settle down, uh, because otherwise firms will need to have a license in the UK and a license in Europe, in, in, in any European country, uh, to be able to offer services in the UK and in the group of the EU. Even, the, even though the UK has, has an, um, an amazing regulator, the FCA has definitely been uh, a beacon. I mean, they were giving amazing guidance, not just uh, to, to FCA regulated firms, but on, on, on many issues related to, uh, uh, to compliance and AML, while they were, still, they were still part of the European Union. We still need to see how passporting is going to work with, uh, with UK-based firms. Now, having said that, a good jurisdiction in the EU, I will say that has to be a jurisdiction that, first of all, has a regulator that understands business, a regulator that's aware of the implications of having a regulated firm, that has a business environment that can support businesses, that is, that is uh, business friendly, that is encouraging for people to come uh, from abroad and sell down so they can uh, run their business, uh, a business environment where you can have service providers that can support you, and, and also a business environment where language is not going to be a problem. I mean, I can tell you many jurisdictions in the EU where even though the, the framework is uh, for, for businesses, for businesses is, uh, is pretty attractive, they don't have all of the components, they don't have all of the ingredients. So having said that, uh, I believe that Cyprus is a very good option, exactly because I think it ticks most of the boxes. Now, uh, talking about CASP, the crypto uh, service provider license, even though in Europe, Malta was probably the first country that implemented this new this registration for crypto businesses and for crypto exchanges, uh, followed by Estonia and then other countries in the Baltic, Malta never managed to kind of pick up and uh, uh, and become a leader in terms of having the, most of the crypto exchanges in Europe. Estonia did, but maybe Estonia moved too fast. They, I think they came to a point where they realized that they had uh, too, many, too many entities regulated. So the regulator at some point just told them, look, let's just wait. We need to change the regulatory framework. There is no single jurisdiction that's going to be ideal. Maybe one jurisdiction is going to be ideal for a specific point in time, but then things change. 
but Cyprus is in in many in many respects like a medium risk country. It's like a, usually considered as a medium risk country uh, in um, risk matrix matrices of most uh, obliged entities. In Basel AML index, it is ranked uh, 67th among uh, 110 countries, just in the middle between Antigua and Barbuda and Switzerland. In Corruption Perception Index, Cyprus is ranked uh, 53rd amongst uh, 88 between Malta exactly and uh, and Rwanda. So it's just like in many things, in many respects, a, a medium risk country. But on the other hand, um, in March 2022, in a peer review on MIFID compliance, ESMA, which is the European regulator, um, stressed that um, Cyprus retains uh, certain specific shortcomings and supervision of cross-border activities. And how do you think uh, are there some risks um, coming from that direction on like for Cyprus? First, let me address the first part of the question that has to do with, uh, with, with, with Cyprus's ranking in these indices. Considering that Cyprus, I mean, not even 10 years ago, had, had a major issue and was labeled by the European Union as a bad boy and, uh, uh, and being effectively the playground of, uh, of uh, unscrupulous oligarchs, that they were using the banking system to hide their billions which is what caused the, the haircut of 2013. Considering what just happened in less than 10 years ago to where we are now to looking at these rankings and being next to Switzerland, for example, it's much easier nowadays, for example, to open an account in, in any European bank than it is to open an account in, uh, in a Cyprus bank. So, so basically now, if there's something to, to be, to be uh, discussed about uh, Cyprus's attitude towards AML and, and the banking sector and the financial services sector attitude, to, attitude towards AML, anti-money laundering. I would say that maybe they're taking it too far and too, they're being too strict. I mean, we have cases where clients are waiting for months uh, for the KYC from the bank to be concluded before they're allowed to open an account. In the regards to the, to, to the ESMA peer review that was conducted, I don't really agree with that review, and, and, and I'll tell you why. The, the review, I mean, the report, uh, mentions the fact that uh, Cyprus's uh, investment firms are doing a lot of offshore, or not offshore, they're doing a lot of cross-border work, uh, as if this is a bad thing. Whereas uh, the cornerstone of MIFID is the ability of a financial services company that's been licensed in the European Union through passporting to offer its services to, to to clients in other European Union countries. So I really don't understand why this is, this is regarded uh, as a bad thing. Now, they also say that <clears throat> there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of cross-border uh, work that is done by, by these companies with, with inadequate supervision by the, by, by the local regulator. Well, the local regulator over the past uh, few years uh, has, has made amazing work in, in ensuring and tidying things up in regards uh, to making sure that all of the regulated companies here are following the rules. And, and also, we just had a change of, uh, of, of, of the leadership of the Cyprus Securities and Exchange Commission, and we have seen that the, the, the new uh, chairman and vice chairman, they have placed a lot of emphasis on compliance. And these are things that have been actively, thematically reviewed in the industry over, uh, over, over the past few months. Even though we have this, uh, this review from ESMA, I believe that, you know, th that, that Cyprus is, is doing, and the Cyprus Security and Exchange Commission is in the process of enforcing even stricter rules. I mean, this is what we have seen over the past few months. And this is, definitely uh, going to have an impact in the market. Uh, and the impact is definitely bound to, to increase the reputation of Cyprus. In crypto area, of course, Sysic does a very good job. Um, in 2021, in 2021, Sysic issued a directive on registration of CASPs, crypto asset uh, service providers, um, which reflects the activities uh, related to MIFID, and also published what is called a crypto policy statement, in which uh, it actually provided a lot of detail as regards uh, crypto assets. Um, and this actually provides some specific results 
We know that FTX, for example, FTX exchange uh, has just landed uh, on March 2022 on, in Cyprus. Uh, from your experience, and I guess, I mean, here you are the expert, of course. Um, how cumbersome is the process of registration as a CASP? What is your view as the, as the practic- pra- as a practitioner and as, an, as the expert in the, in the area? Well, definitely Cyprus is not going to be a jurisdiction which is going to be uh, very easy uh, applying to if you cannot prove that you have the ability as, as a regulated entity to fulfill your obligations, right? Cyprus has implemented this registration slash licensing for, uh, for crypto asset service providers in accordance with the fifth European AML directive. We know for a fact that we had other jurisdictions where it was a matter of a few weeks to just go there, uh, just set up uh, a company, have a nominee director. You don't really need to have any, any employees. And you start offering crypto exchange services in addition to digital wallet services. The Cyprus Security and Exchange Commission, though, have, has really taken things seriously. And they really want to promote Cyprus as, as a place where innovative technologies, decentralized finance applications, new technology companies can, uh, and especially in relation to to finance, can can thrive. And this is why when they were developing this new registration regime, the way that it was structured, it was structured to ensure that you can only come and apply here if you are going to be a serious player, a serious company in the market. It means that you definitely need to have a solid organizational structure, meaning that you need to have two executive directors, which need to be fit and proper, and their assessment is going to be done according to MIFID. Uh, so these two ex- local local directors or they have to local be local. Yes, or... no, no, they have to be local and local meaning uh, they need to be residents of Cyprus, right? So even if they're foreigners, they have to come and live in Cyprus, and they need to spend their time exclusively being employed for the CASP. Uh, you definitely need to have an AML, comp- an AML slash compliance officer, which also needs to be exclusively employed by the company. He or she has to work uh, on the ground. Uh, you need to have two non-executive directors, which are independent. So basically, we see a lot of elements that were taken from MIFID. So this is not going to be uh, a shell jurisdiction for crypto exchanges, right? This is a very, very serious framework which was structured exactly to discourage anyone that might have any other idea in mind. You asked me initially uh, if it's going to take forever to get the license. Uh, let me just mention that as per the directive that uh, SISEC issued, uh, SISEC can take up to six months to review the application. Uh, so basically, this is the benchmark that we have right now. But uh, we know for a fact that SISEC is taking things very, very seriously. And there's a lot of requirements, but people that are in the crypto industry uh, are not going to find these things uh, um, to be extreme. I mean, these are logical measures that any regulator will require to ensure the two main things that any regulator wants to ensure, not just in Europe, but everywhere. Protection of investors and the protection of the integrity of the market. In the regards to, to AML, I, again, I mean, integrity of the markets, right? Uh, integrity of the markets is, is going to be very, very important. And don't forget that the reason that we have the registration of the crypto exchanges right now, not just in Cyprus, but across Europe, is because as part of the fifth European directive and as part of the Financial Action Task Force recommendations, you need to have a registration of the crypto exchanges. And the registration of the crypto exchanges is not under a standalone directive. It's actually a part of the AML requirements of SISEC. Unless SISEC is satisfied, and pretty much any regulator is satisfied, that the crypto asset service provider or the crypto exchange will have in place the measures that will enable them to know who the client is behind the transaction or behind the deposit or behind the digital wallet, they're not going to be giving any license. Um, another uh, thing that I uh, have um, 
thought about uh, when I looked into the CISEC uh, policy statement was that um, CISEC was defining crypto as digital representation of value that is neither issued nor guaranteed by any central bank or any public authority and does not possess any legal status of currency or money, but is accepted by natural and legal persons as means of exchange and which can be transferred, stored, or traded electronically. So basically, this means that uh, CISEC uh, has started treating crypto as a, a let's say, sui generis currency, which is, okay, not a legal tender, uh, and this means that it's not mandatory to to accept this uh, this method of payment. But as a as a possible legal tender, it's almost one step um, before saying that let's say we accept crypto as a possible let's say alternative legal tender if both sides of a deal, for example, are accepting this. This, this as a matter of payment, as a, as a method of, of payment, just as what is happening right now in Panama, in Brazil and other countries, uh, most of them are in the Western Hemisphere. What do you think about, let's say, the, the perspectives of crypto as, a, let's say, sui generis currency in the European markets? Banks in Cyprus have an extremely low tolerance to cryptos. Uh, I would say zero, zero tolerance to cryptos, right? In Cyprus, after the, after the haircut of 2013, uh, the central bank and the banking sector has, has really been taken aback and they're, they're really uh, trying to be as risk averse as possible. And this is why banks in Cyprus uh, are reluctant to, to take on any company that deals in cryptos. Now, having said that, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing because, I mean, CISEC has no requirement for crypto exchanges, for CASPs to have bank accounts in Cyprus. So basically a CASP that is going to be registered in Cyprus can open bank accounts, it can have client funds accounts in, a, in any bank provided that it's in a, a European Union country or any other reputable country, uh, meaning UK or, or any other big industrial country. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Uh, so. Cyprus as a country has taken, I mean, with the exception of, of CISEC, I think will be very, very risk averse in terms of being first to accept uh, any kind of crypto uh, uh, token as currency. I think what we need to do is probably wait until MIGA comes into play, until MIGA becomes uh, uh, comes in effect in a couple of years. We don't really have a specific date when this is going to happen. However, we do know that MICA is going to be a regulation and not a directive, meaning that it doesn't need to be incorporated into the national legislation to take effect. So from whatever date uh, the European Council is going to give us, it means that from that date on, MICA is going to be in effect. Uh, so we probably need to wait uh, the implementation of MICA and then probably a couple of years to see what's going to happen. Another thing that is um, also important is DeFi. Um, this is also, of course, the matter uh, of, uh, of uh, that will be, I guess, covered by Mika um, in Europe. Uh, but still, um, we have right now the guidance, the FAF guidance on uh, on virtual asset service providers of 2021, in which uh, FATF, I would say, t took. I, I I think that the approach that FATF has taken in this guidance is not the best. Um, I mean, it just does not provide very clear answer what is uh, DeFi and what is not DeFi. Uh, but what's important is that uh, it looks like it, sa it says just, I, I know it when I see it. If I see that it's, it's decentralized enough, then it's uh, DeFi. If it's not decentralized enough, then it's not DeFi. This was uh, the way how actually Estonia made this. And I think this kind of like ruined its uh, crypto industry. But the question is, I think, more practical one that I have. Uh, and it actually comes from many re requests that we have from our clients. And the question is, like, for example, we have a team of people that are generating a DeFi protocol. And so they have a platform, etc., etc. They have a team, of course. Um, and so on one side, in order to eradicate the risk that they are DeFi, uh, not DeFi, that they are like, let's say, a normal um, uh, regulated entity. They need to start KYC in their, let's say, customers. And for that, they need to establish a legal entity. 
because in accordance with GDPR, they have to have a legal entity to be a controller, data controller uh, of the information that they collect from their users. But if they create this legal entity, then they will definitely become a DeFi. So this means that this regulation basically forces them to, um, let's say, uh, unilaterally uh, consider themselves as non-DeFi, even if they could be not, if they could, could be DeFi uh, before they set up a company. Like, um, what is your view? How to, let's say, um, be on the safe side for the genuine DeFi products? Um, and at the same time, not to put themselves under the regulation by KYC and then say setting up a, a company. It's a very interesting question, Tony. Uh, it, <laughs> it is, and I can say a lot of things about that. I mean, I, I have a lot of opinions about the <laughs> uh, about the topic. Now, the the concept of DeFi. I mean, it's very very interesting, right? I will go a step back. DeFi, decentralized finance. I'm not gonna, I don't really consider myself an old timer. I, I don't, <laughs> uh, like I've, I've been around for 50 years. I've definitely been around for a while uh, in the financial services sector and in the uh, regulatory compliance sector. And one thing that I've learned is there is no way that any regulator globally is gonna accept any system of financial services any system that's going to allow the transfer of money or the transfer of financial instruments or the transfer of whatever is going to be considered as equivalent of money without some sort of regulation in place. I think that's a utopia. You will never have that. DeFi, finance, financial transactions, money transactions, financial instrument transactions will always need to be regulated. Why? Because you have people's money. The idea of regulation is not to be a burden on people. The idea of regulation is that you have regulation in place to protect the interests of the average person. And this is why, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in financial services, you have this concept of the retail investor, of the professional investor, of the well-informed investor, depending on the level of understanding and the level of risk that they can take or they can potentially take because maybe they want to take a lot of risk, but the financial capacity doesn't allow them to. So yes, there might be people that said, oh, but the government is not my daddy. I don't want them to, to be there to protect me. Well, maybe, right? But unfortunately, in the environment that we live in right now, this is going to be the case. You will always have regulation whenever you have any kind of financial or monetary transaction. In March, uh, the European Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs uh, approved the amendments to the Europe's Transfer Funds Regulation that requires virtual asset service providers to verify identities of the owners of unhosted uh, wallets uh, before, um, I think, as far as I said, before in advance of the transaction. First of all, uh, what are the prospects of this, uh, these amendments and um, what impact will they have on, on hosted wallets? As you very uh, very accurately said, I mean, this has to do with the, with the fund transfer, right? So, so it's about money. I mean, if you have an unregistered wallet, you want to keep it there. Uh, you don't want to, I mean, you just want to top it up with, with additional cryptos, with additional value, it's fine. But the moment that money needs to be transferred to that, or, or value, comes out of that wallet that needs to be translated into fiat money, that moment, that wallet needs to be, needs to be regulated, needs to be, needs to be registered, right? Because, because otherwise, it, it defeats the whole concept of anti-money laundering. You know, look at it from, from a KYC perspective. I mean, from, um, from the perspective of the risk-based approach that, I mean, anti-money laundering KYC needs to have nowadays, right? You are uh, required, I mean, to place uh, a risk rating on your client. Well, definitely. Uh, you cannot do it without without KYC. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So you have to do it. So you have to do the KYC. And don't forget that you have tools nowadays that also do effectively an, an investigation of the wallets to see what, what kind of transactions this wallet underwent. And this uh, and the analysis of the results of these reports 
can definitely help on the on, on the risk ranking uh, as part of the KYC. So so basically, if you have an unregistered wallet and, and it scores, you know, the, the highest non-compliant mark, then then probably this can be a a, a problem for, for any regulated institution that uh, that wants to take on that client. It implements new regulations for um, uh, remote KYC technologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Will it become more strict uh, for those um, for those companies, for those businesses that are uh, headquartered in Cyprus but are working based on other uh, licenses licenses from uh, uh, less regulated uh, regions, like uh, as, as as we mentioned like some, some uh, tax havens, et cetera, et cetera. Because right now, as we see, some of the companies do like this. Well, look, I mean, in terms of regulation and, and in terms of, of anti-money laundering regulation, uh, the good thing is that we've had a lot of experience over the past years, right? In, in terms of group entities, the guidance has always been that we don't really care if you're headquartered in uh, the Cayman Islands uh, and, and you have a company in Cyprus, even if the company in Cyprus is a subsidiary of the holding company, the Cayman Islands, you need to follow, you need to follow the regulation that we have here in the EU, right? So there will be no discount in terms of allowing less strict regulation for anti-money laundering. So I think that CISEC will always ensure that it's being in line with what is required uh, at the, the European Union level. Exactly because we have this, uh, this consultation paper, which was issued by the European Council in 2018, uh, I believe that the, the rules are pretty uniform when it comes to these kind of technologies and how they can be used by any regulated company in order to satisfy the requirements of the legislation and of the directives. I think that Cyprus is gonna go uh, with the more conservative requirements. Even in areas where the European Council uh, paper gives some leeway, gives some freedom, I think that CISEC will not want to be discounting its own regulation. I mean, our experience tells us that CISEC will want to be prudent and they will want to be conservative and they will definitely want their uh, supervised entities uh, to be adhering to the, to, you know, to, to the highest level of, uh, of requirements at the European level. Uh, final question I have, uh, I think it will be tradition uh, on this channel. Um, it, let's imagine you have become, you have been appointed the head of the national regulator, so in Cyprus, for example. Which, which one would you choose, CISEC or uh, Central Bank? <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the head of CISEC is, is, a, is a good friend of mine, so... Uh, <laughs> 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 but look, I mean, my, my background and experience has been traditionally in financial services, so I mean, probably CISEC. CISEC. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. and I hope to, uh, so George if, forg forgive if me you're... for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's just uh, for, for the sake of for the sake of argument. It's just a hypo. Um, if um, if you would be would have become a uh, head of CISEC, would you do something otherwise as what is done right now by CISEC? No, uh, I think that CISEC is doing an amazing job. I think the the problem that CISEC has that it, I mean, it, it's not with its people. It's not with the leadership. I mean, they have amazing leadership. The problem is the way that CISEC is, is structured as an entity, it's very restrictive. What do I mean? If CISEC needs to hire 10 people, they need to go to the, to the Council of Ministers, they need to, to follow a lengthy procedure, they need to organize examinations, they need to uh, do interviews. It takes a long, long time to get anything done. Not because people are at CISEC are inefficient, but because of the regulatory framework under which CISEC is set up as an organization. If I could change one thing at CISEC was to make it a more flexible organization. But I think for that to happen, it's, it's a government decision, it's a political decision. And traditionally, you haven't seen governments you know, willing to change the status of organizations uh, that have been set up uh, so many decades ago. 
totally agree with you. I also think that uh, what is going on right now in Cyprus is a tremendous, tremendous achievement and tremendous development. And uh, definitely the job that is done right now by the CISEC leadership is a fantastic job. Thank you very much for this interview. Um, this, I think, was very, very interesting for the audience. Uh, that will watch this. Uh, I hope the audience will like this video and leave comments and reactions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Janus. Thank you, Tony. Really enjoyed our conversation.